Yep, it should be coming. There it is. All right. Welcome, everybody, to the May meeting for the Project Management Community Group. It is May 17th, and welcome. We've got an awesome presentation planned for you. Uh, we're going to take care of some housekeeping. Uh, some simple basics for today is uh, uh, we want to avoid, if not eliminate all any all background noise. So um, please be sure to uh, mute yourself. If you're calling in, um, or uh, for whatever reason you need to put us on hold, we ask that you not, because oftentimes your hold, um, your phones often will play music in the background. So that'll, if we could minimize that, that would be great. We all love music, but we don't necessarily need to have it during the presentation. I think you'll find John and Adam's presentation riveting enough. We don't need background music for that. Um, if you have a question or comment to add, just uh, use the uh, Zoom uh, feature to raise your hand and uh, or enter it into the chat and uh, someone will call attention to your question in the chat or um, ask you to unmic and you can ask your question. All right, and just as a reminder, this session is being recorded and as such, I wanted to let everyone know we are going to post this to YouTube uh, so that people can access it later. So keep that in mind. Uh, are we ready for the next slide? All righty. So um, the hosts um, uh, just know that we've got the Project Management Community Group is hosted by uh, two co-chairs. That's going to be Jennifer Birch and Lisa Veloz, as well as a steering committee that includes Carol, uh, John, Adam, uh, myself, and I also believe, is it uh, Frank, Lisa? Anyway, sorry, so Fred. We've got a, Fred, I'm sorry, Frank, <laughs> name Fred. is Fred. Yeah, thank you so much. So uh, this is the steering committee that uh, is uh, the driver and the planner behind all of these monthly meetings. So um, definitely shout out to them for helping us put this together. And on today's agenda, um, we've got um, the 2022 webinar. So mark your calendars and register for those today. And as well as our keynote presentation is all about dashboards given by Adam and John from Kansas State and Notre Dame respectively. So uh, I believe there's another slide. So definitely wanna call attention to the PMCG, the Project Management Community Group. Ah, hopping around. So there's the schedule for the meetings. Um, this reminds me of a sports improv thing I once volunteered for. So here we go. This is the schedule of the meetings that we have. We're always looking for presentations. So if you've got ideas, lessons learned, anything in the realm of project management, feel free to reach out to us and uh, we can definitely put you on the schedule to present. Do note, I want to call attention, it's coming up soon. July, there will be no breeding, that's no meeting. That's when we take a break. And uh, and then, of course, we'll focus, uh, our October meeting will focus on the uh, conference coming up in Denver, Colorado. And again, no meeting in December as well. Next slide. All righty. I'm going to give this over to our two keynotes, Adam and John. And I do want to say, were we going to do the survey announcement after this after the keynote? Because we, we went through that slide pretty quickly. Um, we can post it in the chat. Okay, yeah. So sometime during uh, this session, there'll be a survey that we definitely want to call attention to. Please take the time to take that survey. I am told that it should take you no more than two minutes. So if you're taking any longer than that, um, don't think so hard about the answers. So enough of all that. Let's hand this over to Adam and John, uh, IT Project Dashboard. Take it away, Adam. Great, thanks, Ed. And if you can just give me a quick confirmation that you can see my PowerPoint and presentation, well, that would be great. We see your awesome PowerPoint, and we also can definitely hear you. So, okay. good show. Great. Well, thanks, um, Ed. Um, and I think you may have talked us up a little bit too much today. So let's set expectations, right? Um, I know I've met many of you or had an opportunity to meet some of you in different conferences. My name is Adam Petrie, Director of Project Management with Kansas State University. And I will be presenting today with John Preddy from the University of Notre Dame. That's commonly known as UND, not NDU. I made that mistake twice today, and John has uh, called me out on that. So John is currently serving as the Director of Information Technology within the Alumni Association. And so uh, he and I collaborated a bit on a presentation for today. 
uh, we kind of took each other's presentations and we smashed them together uh, kind of like a Hadron Collider in Switzerland, which uh, that was a rare dad and science joke mashup for those of you keeping track at home. Um, so with that, we'll get into the presentation. So what we're hoping to cover today are uh, what we've determined to be three or four types of dashboards with various purposes. Um, so this is largely from our experience. You all may have different types or categories of, of dashboards uh, with different purposes. So I, at the end, we definitely have time for more of an open dialogue in terms of that. Then we're going to go through uh, my previous two, well, my current and my previous institution, Kansas State University and Bowling Green State University with some examples. I get a lot out of seeing examples from other institutions. Uh, we hope you will as well. And uh, John will show us a, a, a bit more in-depth review of the desktops or dashboards at George Mason. And then as I mentioned, we'll have time for some open discussion. Um, so we will have our slides kind of intermixed and we're also going to be sharing screen for certain pieces of this. Uh, hopefully it comes together, but if you would like, you could always insert a question into the chat. And if Ed, if you don't mind moderating that chat, if anything comes up, that would be great. So we'll go ahead and get started. John, I'll kick it to you for just for this first slide, and then I'll take back over. All right. So one of the things that Adam and I talked about in, in doing some prep work here are you know, different types and, and purposes uh, for dashboards. So uh, we, we talk about our, our internal or operational dashboards that are used for IT. Um, you may see those on a lot of times on service catalogs, um, you know, ticket, tickets, et cetera, on there. Of informational dashboards, what's going on that are you know, a little bit more uh, flowery and front facing. And then, um, so those, you know, those are for our internal teams. Then we have, we look at the external ones, things that we want to show uh, for external customers. Uh, you know, usually folks, you know, maybe outside of IT or leadership looking at that. Um, and those are, you know, also kind of fall into that informational operational aspects as well. So uh, it's a little bit interesting one. You know, we've, we've seen the back and forth here. You know, as, as Adam noted, we're not going to be alternating slide colors for the rest of this presentation with the, with the two templates. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and I'm going to turn it back over to Adam, who's going to open up and, and talk about some of the things that, uh, that he's done in his past at Bowling Green and um, currently at K-State. And then once he's had his chance, uh, he'll turn it back over to me and uh, we'll talk more about uh, some of my past work at Mason. So Adam, back to you. Great, yeah, and uh, our intent was not to create some sort of eye test for today. So yeah, this this is uh, the majority of the switching back and forth. Um, so we wanted to focus on examples of four different types uh, of dashboards or categories of those and kind of split it down into the potential use of, for example, who the audience would be, uh, what the main purpose or driving force or, or why you need to consolidate information and have it available on a dashboard and then also demonstrating some examples. So the first one that we have here is internal to IT in an operational sense. And I'd say largely what I've used this for both at Kansas State University and Bowling Green State University are mostly for project teams, um, developers, project managers, and also IT resource managers of folks who are managing uh, the, the people side of things. That's largely what we've used internal operational dashboards for. So of course that, that involves task and work management. And as you dig deeper down into that, also resource management and visibility. Um, some of what we've done recently at Kansas State University is we've implemented uh, team dynamics. Uh, we're actually switching from service now to team dynamics for PPM and ITSM. We completed our PPM transition uh, about two months ago, a month and a half ago, and our ITSM piece goes live in June. So we're really looking forward to that. So in terms of internal operational, I have more dashboards that are focused on the project side of things. So the first thing we had to identify is what type of information uh, are you trying to serve up for those audiences that we mentioned? So here's an example of a dashboard we created that is looking at our, our larger enterprise projects and separating it into the types or the classification of the work that is there. And, uh, you know, we just produce these very operational focused uh, desktops or dashboards. And so we also have the list of the things that make up these desktops or dashboards. This is just an example of one that we share with a pretty large group. Um, we also have 
a very similar one that we go through a weekly project standup that has all of our enterprise projects. So here they are organized by portfolio and also by program. And then by status, here are the on holds and the new. Uh, here's the pipeline, and then ultimately here's how it's split up into different pieces of metadata. And this is what we have in the hands of our IT leadership, IT managers, and on our um, basically, I should say everyone in IT has access to this, and we go through it in a standup once a week. For individual teams, uh, my team has started to stand up dashboards for uh, the work that we do and the way that we visualize it. So this is just a very simplified view into the pipeline of new requests coming in. Once the request is formalized, here's how we visualize the work into these steps with some scoring and a little bit of visualization there. And then ultimately how we manage our project related work and in what ways. So projects, tasks, some meta data view of that. So that is largely how we take a look at our internal IT operational. Uh, the next one we wanna take a minute is internal IT, but it's more informational. Um, I, I'd say the audience there is mostly IT leadership. And I won't dive into this one too much because really it's just a higher level view or higher level look um, into what is going on within our organization and into individual teams. Um, so really it could, could be for anyone within IT, um, but it, it, it's mostly focused at uh, resource managers and also leadership. So we do have internal examples. I have an example here. It served up in much of the same way that our operational ones are. And we also have for individual teams, just the look at their project work. We are planning on standing similar type dashboards uh, once we have the ITSM side in production, but that's something that we're gonna be working on that we're still a bit away from. So again, these are both internal to IT. One is more operational focus, something that you can take action on. The other one is more informational focus, mostly highlighting you know, bits of information and metadata for leadership, uh, but both are equally as important. All right, the next we wanna talk about was external to IT, and this is mostly informational. Uh, so we have the audience here, and what we focused on for the audience is not only university leadership, kind of our portfolio area sponsors, uh, but also our governance group, which we call our project governance group, or PGG. And, and essentially, it's for everyone in the university. This is uh, reporting that we stand up in front of everyone um, behind our login, um, but anyone can get access to it. And I will say that this is a bit of... Uh, a, a bit of behind the curtains because we haven't actually gone live with this yet. We're introducing our new website, new reporting, and ITSM all on June 6th. So in the three weeks, uh, we're going to be releasing this. So some of this, I, I uh, you know, hasn't been released to the public yet. So you're going to get a little bit of a view into this. So where I did want to start first is um, what I stood up at my previous institution, which is Bowling Green State University, and they have this this setup or exposed to anyone. So you don't need to be behind a login. So this is leveraging data within their PPM or ITSM tool directly uh, using Power BI and then serving it up on a public web page. So here's the approved projects and enhancements, again, integrated with Power BI data. This is a pretty simple report. It's uh, kind of a Gantt, high level Gantt view of projects with some summary information on there. Um, then what was of most use while I was at Bowling Green is this VP or portfolio report because we had all of our VP areas um, accounted for on our governance group. And so when we went into those governance meetings, we could say, well, if you're our enrollment management VP, the information that you wanna see for your portfolio is right here. And, and I was really happy to see uh, that that's what those VPs were using uh, to come prepared to the meeting to understand the projects that were in flight or coming down the pike and how to interact um, with the other projects. So this was a very useful report. Um, we would also serve up the pipeline public facing. Uh, we weren't trying to hide what that pipeline looks like or request that we have coming in. So we had the individual steps within getting a project request approved, some summary information in the department that came up into. And I will say that many of these reports do have multiple pages. If you're familiar with Power BI, it's pretty easy to do that. So for example, this completed projects and enhancements, we set this up in a pretty simple way that 
this is all project related work in, and that you can see summaries for departments and portfolios and priorities and managers. Uh, but then also clicking through here, you can get just what we would call a project and then just what we would call an enhancement to give you a little bit more information on that. So that's largely what we did at Bowling Green. And we, again, layered Power BI on top of the data to visualize it a bit better. What we're planning on standing up at Kansas State University is very similar to what we stood up at Bowling Green State University, mostly because I am, in fact, a one-trick pony and have you know no new ideas coming into my head <laughs> these days. But this should look very familiar. Uh, we don't have Power BI stood up on top of our project data. Uh, we plan to do that. So outside of that, we're just exposing public reports uh, through our PPM tool, which is Team Dynamics and putting a little bit of information about what those are. So again, these are our approval pipeline, active projects, some summary information about all of our projects and then projects completed this year. Uh, so this is the type of information that we're, we're standing up for those groups. All right, um, with that, I, before I hand it over to John, I did wanna kind of pitch this out. So the last category I alluded to would be external to IT that's also operational. The last one we were talking about was external to IT informational. So no one really takes action on any of that data. Um, would, would love to hear from the group if there's anybody that has gone down this route. We haven't really had the need to do that. I, I know many EPMOs probably have. Uh, the state of Kansas is actually doing this right now a bit um, they have, uh, the state of Kansas has project reporting requirements uh, through the legislature. Uh, and so agencies that are either entirely or partially funded by state funds need to do some uh, operational type reporting through the state. Uh, so I don't know, I, I just pause there for 10 seconds to see if anyone has tackled that in terms of external to IT and operational reports that really is more in the space of maybe an EPMO. Adam, um, UH Clear Lake, we monitor all of our, so you're talking about projects that are external to IT? No, so this was data or dashboards that are being exposed that are external to IT. So it could be external projects, but it's basically just that data or those dashboards being exposed externally. I was just curious if anybody from this team has had to, to go about any of that, because we haven't either found the need to um, or, or done that. We report basic information across all projects, whether they're IT or not, so we don't like lump lump them together like these are internal and these are external but we're a small regional university so there's really all of our projects are just going to be included just because our size so these are largely and and may i probably didn't have this position in a way that made sense so if i confuse everyone for the past 10 minutes this is largely the audience so external to it is the audience of the operational type dashboards or external to it is the audience of the information um, okay so hopefully that makes sense now that I've already done my part of the presentation. All right. Well, if not, I think we'll transition over to John. So I will stop my share, John. If you don't mind taking it from here, that'd be great. All right, let me pull up my screen share here and make sure I find the right desktop here. I think it's this one. Are you seeing the, that's a good transition slide. Yeah, we should be good to go. All right, thank you. Okay, so with that's a good uh, transition, um, let me talk a little bit about, I know it's weird with me seeing uh, Notre Dame stuff on here, but for the 15 years prior to six weeks ago, um, I was at George Mason doing work there and I wanna do a special shout out to uh, John McShay and Mary Beth Luffglass who are both from Mason uh, who are on the call. So if you have specific things of what's going on, maybe what's what's happening most recently, uh, feel free to add those into the chat and they're here to help field any questions you may have as well. Uh, one of the things that we'll be talking about are things that we did with our dashboard uh, at the Mason time, and then some of the things that they're working on today uh, that are, are some of those more operational areas, um, focusing on also being a, a team dynamics um, on the service request uh, metrics 
uh, pulling it, pulling information out of that system for better reporting as well. So uh, just by way of background at Mason, I will uh, preface this by saying, if you hear a we at any point in time in here, um, I apologize, 15 years of habits are hard to break. Um, and for my Notre Dame uh, counterparts that are on the call, um, I apologize to, to you as well. So, uh, so background at Mason, there's been a SharePoint-based project inventory that was, they started back in 2014. Um, in an on-prem solution, there was the CIO at the time said, show me a list of all the projects. And myself and one other project manager who comprised the uh, PMO at that time said, sure, gave a list of about 25 projects. She laughed in our face, said, no, really, show me all the projects. Um, you've probably heard me say that before. Shaking the trees a little bit, next thing we knew, we had a list of 100 that we decided to put into a SharePoint list for easier access, reporting, et cetera. That's been built out over years. And in early 2020, just before COVID hit, we had completed a migration from on-prem to a SharePoint online environment. So while Mason uses um, Project Online as, as one of the project type environments, um, this is actually just a based on a SharePoint site within that environment. Uh, we found that the overhead was a little bit lighter. So it, it's, it's a series of SharePoint lists. Uh, pain points we had at the time were, you know, we had these lists that were great. We captured a lot of information, but there was really no way to uh, present that information beyond list-based reporting. So we found if people weren't, they weren't going to the project inventory for information and they weren't recognized and they could, you know, you could build um, personal views to get the information you want and I may have had 25 personal views because I use it all the time, but the casual user, it just was not uh, fitting their experience or an executive level audience. We did canned reports that had some visuals in there, similar to, to the pie charts uh, that Adam showed in, in his reporting. Send them out every week to folks, but they're static. And by the time they'd get them, they'd be out, out of date. Um, so you know, we'd, we'd cut them off and then people would update stuff and then it would be a week before we'd see the, those changes on there. So, you know, some of the things we did, um, we just recognized that we were, we were kind of up against a wall. So really about a year ago now, uh, we had a, a developer on staff who I found out she knew a little bit of Power BI. And I said, hey, here's our inventory, see what you can do. And that was the requirements that we gave. Uh, two weeks later, she showed up and said, here, take a look at this. We had a dashboard with about five different views on there, uh, many of which are still part of the dashboard today. Uh, I showed it to our CIO who said, we need to show this to the VP, um, or EVP on his boss. And we got the, you know, the reactions, things like, that's awesome. Where's all that information come from? Um, well, we really have had all this information. We've been collecting it for the last six, seven years. Um, we, we need to get this you know, out in front of folks. We need to show it to them. And, uh, and really the surprising of, wait a minute, I can click on it, it's interactive. So you know, in looking at that, we said, we need to get this out there. So we built a, a page on our, on our website around the dashboard and we exposed it. Unlike what Adam showed from BGSU, uh, we exposed it, but you have to, um, log in to get there. So any faculty and staff at Mason can see this, but the general public cannot. And that's because there's some sensitive information out there. Um, sometimes there may be uh, selection projects or things that we're doing, uh, potential uh, budget numbers that could be misinterpreted as we're looking at things like staff time, staff resources, et cetera, uh, and not just contract funding that shows up in those numbers. So some of the things that we had from the current state uh, at the time that I left are um, you can get uh, point in time views. And so we can see that, you know, we, we get some of that timeline capabilities, but a lot of this is here's what it, things look like right now. Um, and here's what's forecast for the future. But we don't see, we're not getting a lot of that trend analysis uh, level, which is really a next step of, oh, you know, how many projects are we closing in an average, you know, three month time period or, um, you know, what are, are we late? Are we on time with our with our schedules? Um, what you know? What are our re resource forecasting, et cetera? So there's definitely room for growth out there, but we do have some really good views in there, and I'll I'll demo those in a, in a minute um, that we show that are just general customer focused, um, 
things, specific audiences like our audit, I'll show you um, a status view of what's the status of my project and just some, and some consolidated portfolio view. So it's really, and when you see the Power BI, it's interesting because what Adam showed a few minutes ago, uh, Mason has some, some very similar things. So at this point, I'm gonna flip over to the dashboard and show you some stuff there. When we share this presentation afterwards, you will see um, some snapshots of slides just for, for the record for you to be able to, to see some of that information that we had out there um, on some of these pages. So it will give you just a little bit of a record there with, with some of the numbers and things redacted off of those pages too. So um, John you'll, you know, and Mary Beth, you guys will be happy to know that I did cover up some of that stuff. So with that, I'm going to escape out of presentation mode. And I'm going to, once I get, see what's going on in the background here, get over to just do a, a quick plug for the, the website um, at Mason. I recommend anybody, if you're looking for great information, the team has done an awesome job out here. It's simply its.gmu.edu. And we're very open to sharing things that have been done. And the two main areas for the teams are projects and project management, and then the also the technology investment request lifecycle. So lots of information on governance processes, as well as where you can get to dashboard templates, et cetera. So coming off of there, we've got the, the, um, the, the dashboard page, which is one of the links off the main page. And when you have access, you have to, to sign into it. I'm already logged in on the background. Um, thankfully, they've not uh, completely shut out my access yet. McShay, no ideas after the meeting. I did ask Charlie about this. And I know you've removed other access, um, so I can't change anything. But this is the, the wrapper page around our dashboard. So it, it explains what the visualizations are, provides some tips and tricks and FAQs. We can go into a full page view of the dashboard. And some of the things that we have on here, I'm gonna I'll quickly talk through a few of the views and, and show some of the things that we can do. So our main summary view really gives an overview of what's going on. And some of the things we like on this page are, I, I can look and see we're in May right now. We have five projects, for instance, that are set to wrap up in May. So I can quickly click on that and see, oh, here are those five projects and what's going on with them. I can undo that filter. I can look and see, you know, what's the status of our projects reporting? Oh, we have six projects that report at risk. I can, come on. Now it doesn't want to do it. Worked for me before. Um, now it's catching up. There we go. So you can see, here's my projects that are at risk. Get a quick view there. I can also filter on some different areas for teams. So if they're looking at it within a particular team, our process team is one of the things we look at here. We can look and see, let me turn off that filter. Here are the status of our process projects. And we can, we can get a feel for that and look and use the different filters we have available to us at the top, as well as the interactive nature in here from our, from our visuals and, and then bring up the filtered list. Mouse over anything on the list. My stuff is showing up funny. Um, you can mouse over anything on the list and it will give you a little, little pop-up overview of what's, what's the content in that particular project, little description and some, some details. A couple other views to show. One of them we use, I'm gonna pop over actually to our queued projects because it's got some good info on here. These are projects that aren't started. One of the things that we did was we actually, they split the, our queues into three different groupings, whether it's uh, maintenance, uh, required maintenance type of efforts, um, mandates, things that have to be done, and strategic, which are really the everything else projects. We can look at any of those queues and we have a, a view over here that we, we looked at from, a, from an intake process of a, um, it's really like a cost benefit sort of thing. We call it impact and effort. So we can look and see where are things where the impact outweighs the effort. That's really this diagonal line here to see the things that we should do. Ideally, we wanna do things that are higher on the impact scale and lower on the effort scale. So we can pick that up and say, oh, okay, that's something great. Whereas something over here that's very low impact but very high effort, uh, we like to think of those as stinkers, but a lot of times those fall under mandates, so we don't really have a choice. And you can see this here is actually a mandate, not a choice to do it, but it lets us know that, hey, this is a high cost without a lot of real customer-focused benefits there. 
for individual users um, and different status things, we built a status view. Um, this is in the process of a refresh. Let me go ahead and pull up uh, one of my favorite old projects that I worked on during my time. We can look and see, but this gives, we call it a baseball card view of, of any project. So you can see the description, accomplishments, next steps, key deliverables and milestones, any particular issues, um, and some general cost information. This is where we, we bring those up, as well as you know, just quick, quick hit status stuff on here. So things that we can look at, that's our baseball card view. We can also look at um, program level. This is one of the newer areas of being able to associate multiple projects into a program area. So that lets us look and see things that we may have already finished. So here we're looking at um, quality management is what they was what the effort is. And as part of that, you know, one of the projects we worked on was reworking the, the PM framework, working on the governance piece that I showed a moment ago, and, and some other projects in that area. We can look and see and get to feel some of the, the, the timing related to those efforts as well. You can see we get the Gantt chart view at the bottom there. We have, just as Adam showed, um, customers. So they can look and see, hey, who, you know, what's my customer that we're looking at? So if I want to look and see in our, our registrar's office, for instance, as a customer, what are the projects that they've got? Hey, we can look and say, we've got two projects that are active for you right now. We wrapped up. I mean, we've got four projects that we've already finished and, and one of them's in queue. So we can start to get our customers to get a feel for, we really are doing a lot for you when they may sometimes think that they weren't. Uh, one of the newest visualizations was around audit. So again, um, looking at the audit perspective, there were 80 some different audit findings that internal audit had us tracking. Those are rolled up into six areas to, to get rid of, you know, as I like to call the whack-a-mole model of you're treating a symptom versus treating an underlying um, issue. So with those being rolled up, now the auditors could come in and say, oh, okay, what's going on in a particular area? And I'll always pick on portfolio and project management. And they can look and see, hey, here's what's going on in those areas and what the work is that's being done. And they can look at it from their perspective and see that information. Now, two more that I'm going to show. I'm going to skip over some. One of our favorites were the dependencies area. And this was a separate list where we just link things just to give people a visual of how different projects um, are awaiting the work of others. So this is just a, a simple view where we can say project B is dependent on project A. So I could not complete my tenant unification project here until I, or I couldn't, sorry, I could not finish my Blackboard 2FA project or my, my WebEx decommissioning until I completed the, the Office uh, 365 tenant unification. So this has to be done before these other two. And that let us, people see what was, you know, what the, the roadblocks were. Um, still, you know, it's kind of a manual process to do it, but it, people kind of latched on and, and like that visibility aspect of it. Finally, one of the things we look at are, you know, being able to expose the project management documentation. So this is one of the things to be able to look and see any particular project we can look at. So I can look and see, you know, the, the same project I've been showing all along. I can look and see, I've got a, my intake document, my charter, uh, don't have the planning document, closeout report not showing up yet, it should guys. Um, it should have been uploaded before I left last month. So, but to see that information out there, and then you have a quick link to be able to open up any of those documents if you wish. So it's just some of the things that we see coming off of the, um, the dashboard that we were doing uh, from the Mason perspective and how things were growing. And I'm gonna come back into my presentation now, bring it up here, come back into my slideshow. And use that to catch my breath. This is just, as I mentioned, some of the slides that I showed in here. And I'm going to wrap up here and escape out of slideshow mode and stop my share. So if folks have questions, uh, we can look to see. And Ed, were there any questions that come, came through? I know that, you know, as you guys were saying before the meeting, I was highly caffeinated and talking very quickly. So um, if there are any questions, let me know now. Yes, yes, you were. But do not be intimidated by the 32 ounce energy drink that John has had prior to this presentation. You're welcome to put there is nothing in chat at this moment. So 
um, this is a good a good opportunity for anyone uh, listening to go ahead and put any questions they may have in the chat. I'm happy to read those out, especially if you're bashful and don't want your voice to be recorded. Happy to do that. You can also raise your hand. Let me get that monitor up so I can see if anyone's raising their hand to ask questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious, John, when you mentioned working with uh, somebody on the team that had Power BI experience, um, what what did you provide in terms of specs or scope to say, you know, here's the audience and here's what we're looking for? I'd, I'd be really interested to see, you know, what you ended up providing them to produce the types of dashboards that you ended up using, or if it was just, hey, go nuts, here's the data. So it was really from, from us, um, I said, here's the data. And some of what we're looking at are, hey, you know, can you show me things that are maybe um, out of date? Uh, so show me the projects, you know, show me a list or a way to see things that are coming due soon or past their deadline. Um, I had that, that matrix or that, that grid that I showed um, with the plotting of, of the impact and effort. I actually had done something like that manually years ago. So I showed that a little bit, but I really, did not want to constrain Tori, our developer on this, because I didn't want to be limited by what I knew. I wanted to see what could be done. So it was really just um, have fun with it and you know, look and see, but we want to be able to, to, to see pictures and visualizations of, of the data versus really just having a list. Gotcha, we've uh, got two questions, uh, so. Adam, did you have anything else before I get to these two questions? Uh, no, thanks, John. Okay, perfect. So um, question from Terry, what are the essential core data elements for a foundational start? So uh, Terry, was that addressed to Adam, me, both of us? Do you wanna clarify a little bit? Yeah, I guess either. Um, I, I guess I'm starting from like the, you know, the, the data source uh, before we can work the visualization like we've got that and we're trying to normalize that uh, across different groups and and given your you know your both of your experience I guess just curious what would you know what have you learned as the the right level of detail and the right you know um, the right piece of the data to begin to bring this to life you know if you had to go back and work it you know work it again so I'll, I'll jump in from from my perspective you know we were fortunate that we had a <clears throat> we had that list that we had been working off of for a few years. So we had gone through some, a, a bunch of iterations, but what I would recommend is, you know, just a, you know, the, a core set of data elements that, that are, can be consistent across multiple projects and, and what you're looking at there. If you're looking to report on the project side, the other thing too is anything that is uh, categorizing type of information. So for us, um, you can see in there, in that dashboard alone, there's probably five different views that are all very similar um, because we're, we were trying to figure out what would resonate most with folks. So there's portfolio or there's programs, there's customers, there's um, more like functional areas and there's audit. Those are all sort of different types of views of that same information because it can ne there was never really a consistent a kind of normalized way to, to present it. And I can, I can see we got John on here now. So maybe, you know, he can let, you know, provide any, uh, McShay, if you want to pipe in, if there's, you know, anything that that's may have gone on more recently, if, if folks are, are looking at that, at that data and ways to present it. Sure. Uh, so thank you for uh, the invitation. I would like to do, I know we don't want to make everybody's eyes go sideways, but I do have a, a screen I can share with the team. And um, so I'm not the PM of the project. So I kind of like to let Mary Beth Lifglass, who's on the call, kind of walk through, uh, at least from a project perspective, what we're looking for. And then I would like to kind of just share. So this is uh, team dynamics data. And I know, uh, Adam, maybe this is relevant to you. because I know uh, you were showing us some team dynamics dashboards. So what we have here is, I'll, and I'll go ahead and let Mary Beth do the, do the. So I don't know if you're, know. you're not sharing yet. I don't know if you have the ability to share. I'm going to share right now. You can now. go ahead and pull it up. So um, basically this is more on the operational side rather than on the project side. But um, as John said, we are using team dynamics for all of our incident and service request tracking uh, tickets. And so one of the things that we were having challenges with is lots of tickets that may have been 
uh, outdated or they've been sitting there for a while, but having lots and lots of reports that had lots, you know, thousand rows and reports. And so what we really were looking for is an executive level dashboard for all of our team dynamic incident tickets and service request tickets. So, uh, so that our CIO and our, you know, senior leaders could take a look at this and really drill, drill down and see where our challenges are, see how we're doing. Are we getting better? Doing a little bit more trend analysis because we sort of were mostly focused on what's happening right now about individual in incident and tickets like that. So John, this again was the same developer. And one of the things that you talked about in terms of how did you get started? Well, we were lucky that the developer that John Creddy was mentioning, Tori, had done this for many other organizations. He's a contractor. So she was able to bring us in this case, some sample, what I call CIO dashboards. And so we were able to give her the raw data, but she had also had, had experience doing this for other organizations. So that helped us with that starting point. And so she had some ideas. She didn't, wasn't coming completely from scratch. So John, you wanna go ahead and talk about some, some of this. So we have different tabs along the left-hand side. This is the summary level. So you can take a look at, you know, the percentage that we're getting in by certain dates and time range. Here's the top, top five service requests and you can sort of see what they are. Um, classroom support, um, Patriot Pass, which is basically our ERP kinds of information, information requests that are coming in, two-factor authentication. There's been a lot of questions on the, uh, uh, in the, 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 your blogs and whatnot on 2FA recently I've noticed. Um, and then obviously like an Adobe software request, which is a common area. So these are areas that we can take a look at trends over time the kinds of information, how we're doing. So then we also have incident requests. We have service requests and they have incident requests, which are obviously are different. So are we getting better? Or are, or is there perhaps certain reasons why we have spikes? And so people can take a look and delve in deeper. Um, and so we, those are the top, in, the next one down, down is the detailed request. So you can take a look at details if you wanna go delve deeper. So you can either take a look at the high level or you can go down. And so the top level is the graphics, the bottom level is individual details, so you can say, whoa, why do we have this? How long, how come this has been in this queue for so long? And you can delve into the details should the, uh, any of our end users want to take a look. Um, and then uh, take, are you going to, John, you think you should show them your, uh, John McShay, show your, your Q&A. So in addition to taking a look in these CAN reports, there's also the ability to take a look and answer, take a look and have any questions. So if you take a look at this, we have uh, lots and lots of data in there. So you can see how many, uh, how many thousands of information, but he's entering it and if you can read it out loud, you can take a look at, for example, how many incidents do we have for Blackboard? So it went down from 200 and some thousand down to 17,000. So you can continue to drill down and answer any questions that you're interested in. So it's kind of like you're ask anything. And so it's kind of a, kind of a fun kind of thing uh, to do. So these are just some ideas. And this is more, as I said, an operational dashboard, which is a little different than our project management dashboard. Um, and so this, the intention of this right now is for our IT senior leadership, but we do have the plans to put this out for our external audiences as well. So people want to look and see how we're doing. We're going to sort of put it all out there and show the, uh, the things that we're being very successful at and things that we need some, need some additional resources to uh, get some of our stats in a little bit better shape. Oh, so Mary Beth and John, here. you just accidentally made a best friend in me. So I, this is <laughs> kind of looking like the direction I want to go in because I'm, I'm definitely focused on the project side of the house. And I feel like we have that well in hand. Right. This is something that we need to focus in on next, which is more of the ITSM side of the house. So you may have accidentally found somebody to, that's going to latch on to you and ask you some additional questions on this. Well, there you go. And I will <laughs> tell you that so Team Dynamics does not have a direct connection to Power BI, but you can export from Team Dynamics. And then you can sort of import into Power BI. And John McShay, who's our wonderful driver here, he's, he's selling himself short. He's also the architect and designer and did a lot of the behind work in addition to our Tori, our contractor. So he's created some automate uh, capabilities that have automated a lot of this daily uploads. And so we're able to get those connections fairly it was manual before. Now it's not manual any, really anymore. So John, if you want to share any more about sure. how you, the, the tricks that you did to make it all sure. the magic happen behind the scenes. Sure. So, um, you know, as, as Mary Beth mentioned, there is not a, we have not found a direct hook yet into team dynamics, but we, what we did is, so we get email reports and they go into a specific folder and we're going to be productionizing that pretty soon. Uh, but that folder, um, and we have a power automate workflow, which has been set up to, to basically listen for any files coming in. Um, and then what it does is it translates um, the original 
report name and uploads it. So, so say, so you have the same report name uh, each day, it just gets updated and replaced. So, and then Tori on the back end has a, an automation job set up to, for auto refresh. So it's a, it's a combination of, you know, sort of the strategy from the project management side from Mary Beth, pulling in a lot of experts from Team Dynamics internally. Um, it's, it's Tori with her uh, Power BI development skills. I, I, have, I have a little bit of skills developing too in the, from my past life, but it's really a team effort. So, you know, when you're going into this, you know, try to pull in as many people as you can because, you know, then you get the best ideas and then you can kind of build it out the way that you want it. Um, so happy to share information about how we, how we did it at a, at a different meeting or another time. But that's, that's where we are with this. Awesome. We've got a couple more questions in here. John's answered this one. So Adam, I'll, I'll field this to you so we can get your answer from your current institution. Or I guess it would have been from Bowling Green, actually. Um, there's a question about licensing in Power BI. Does everyone have access to Power BI at, uh, it was the Bowling Green dashboard you were showing us, right? Yeah, so you can kind of just stand up a public uh, report and put it in, I'm not a web developer, but put it in an iframe essentially mm -hmm. and present that to everyone. That's the direction we went uh, just to make it easier for people to get to. Uh, when I joined K-State, they had some ticket and operational dashboard set up uh, using ServiceNow data, and that was uh, through Power BI. So you'd have to log into 0365 and you know navigate to Power BI, or however you'd get access to that, and then you would have to have you know access to Power BI. But the way that we exposed that uh, at Bowling Green was basically through an iframe, and it was for everyone. So no, you don't have to. But we also accepted a certain amount of risk that you know that data is out there in the world. We could have put that behind a login, those pages behind a login, but that's. The direction we wanted to take to make it as easy as possible for those VPs to get access to the information. And Vanessa has a question in here. Um, after you've created the dashboards, did they give you insights that made you change how you manage or think about projects? And part two, uh, no, that was actually a compliment, not a second part of the question. She's saying excellent presentation, by the way. So uh, uh, good job, guys. So any thoughts, Adam, did, did, did the dashboards give you additional insights that made you change how you think about projects? No, you know, we just dug ourselves into a happy little rut and <laughs> didn't make any changes after that. No, I, I think that's a great question because we we certainly did change our approach and how we were managing our portfolios and even our programs at that level uh, because we were seeing uh, teams, functional areas, business offices that were being as overwhelmed and overrun as we felt we were based on the volume of projects that we had in that area. It, it honestly just takes you know, somebody to care about that and to kind of champion and own that resource leveling piece. But yeah, we, we absolutely did. And um, it created some, uh, you know, tough conversations at the governance level to say, when we're taking these things in and it's a high priority, we need to talk about the lower priority things that will need to slip for those resource teams in order to do the work. And are you willing to make that make that trade off. And so it did actually prompt at the governance and, and cabinet level some conversations about what we should be taking on and when. And I will say that, you know, we had established some core pieces of metadata that matched our current project process. And oftentimes exposing the data like this would challenge that process a bit. So we started out with just with statuses, dates, health, portfolios, programs, percentage, priority, stuff like that. Um, but at the end of the day, the whole thing only really works if people trust the data that's in there. So we definitely took a simplified approach when we stood up some of these reports and said, here's the data elements we can control best. So we know that it's always correct to some level of certainty. And then we, we don't report on the additional pieces of data that the resource teams have more control over. So they may not be as accurate or up to date. You know, that, that kind of goes beyond the question a bit, but that's how we've managed to, uh, you know, produce trust in the data. Gotcha. The question from Jennifer, um, do you have insights into who's actually looking at the reports and whether or not it's providing any benefits or having a positive impact? I was gonna take a real quick stab at that, because that last question, because one of the things that's very interesting is uh, since we just, uh, with this uh, operational dashboard is fairly new for us, like in the last month or so. And since that has been happening, our CIO has decided he's going to, taking a look at some of this data and looking at it by group and being able to see where some of our 
stress points are, he has decided that he's going to start meeting with these folks uh, every couple of weeks to go through their data. Now that he's able to see it and able to take a look at where some of these challenges are and try to get down and delve a little bit deeper. So it's interesting. It's got a lot more information and a lot more focus on the information. So we do know that our senior leaders are taking a look at this and working with each one of those, um, each one of those, the directors in their particular offices. And we're also finding that as because it has now become more transparent, even this data in general was open to others. Now that it's easy to see in a dashboard environment, we're also finding that some of our service owners are taking a little bit more careful and a look at their tickets and their data and making sure they're closing them out and that they're accurate because this data is now being seen by a, a wider audience. Yeah, I think that's a great way to serve that up because once you find yourself on the my tickets or services are on the naughty list because they've been out there for 90 days, it's amazing how some of those just get cleaned up. So yeah, that's a great point. And actually, personal experience, I find that the visualizations help uh, help our team. We see, oh, we need to update that information. We need to update that piece. Of the, you don't see that in this ma in a massive tabular list, but you do see it in a graph. So very helpful. And that probably is a good segue to this next question. And Fred is addressing it to the uh, entire group of presenters. So he says there in the chat, sounds like you were able to better communicate project status and Gartner support uh, through these dashboards. And have you measured the impact these have had on the actual project completion? So similarly, but talking about the actual progress of the project itself, have you been able to uh, renegotiate problem projects or have found better access to obtaining resources, et cetera? So I'll say just briefly, uh, my time at Bowling Green, we weren't able to come up with those metrics and collect those metrics up front uh, to that level of degree. Um, but I think what this did end up doing is it, it allowed us to kind of champion a process for a six to 12 month postmortem on projects uh, that were of higher priority or higher cost. And so we would establish some KPIs on the project and then do a retrospective. It wasn't necessarily to you know confirm that we met the date that we set out to meet and things like that. It was more focused on what we established as being the key benefits for this or other KPIs and six to 12 months down the road, are we really realizing those benefits? And that was served back up to our project governance group um, with the hope that we would authorize like projects if it was successful or steer clear of similar projects if they weren't as successful. So not direct answer to your question, but that's that's the direction we took with it. And that's, that's the direction that I'm planning on heading in Kansas State as well. And Fred, from a, from a Mason perspective, one of the things it did, especially when working with groups outside of the central IT organization, such as the provost office, it helped better articulate the projects that they had going on and where the resource impacts were within IT so that they could negotiate and say, hey, here is, you know, he, here are the, the three or four things you've got on the plate that you're, you're saying are all your priorities help us understand and put those in, in what your actual priority order was. So what it did was, you know, one project in particular, they were able to say, hey, we recognize that we can't do this right now. Um, so let's, let's put that into a kind of a mothball type of state as we focus on these other, other activities. Um, and one of the things I didn't show was there's a major, major initiative that, that's supposed to go live in the next six weeks that has really done a lot for mothballing a lot of other efforts to say we need to just wait until this one is done before having the resources because it's all hands on deck for that effort. Thank you both. Any other questions? Lisa, that sounds like that's a wrap. Excellent presentation, John, Adam. Appreciate it very much. I guess this is my cue to take the outro since I did the intro. Um, so just a reminder, uh, share your uh, 
topic ideas, uh, ideas are and or volunteer to present. We're always looking for good stuff. And I, we know that you're doing good stuff. So don't be bashful. The processes that you've changed, things you've tweaked, stuff you've done in your, your own project areas. It's all good stuff to bring forward because we're all learning this together. So. Oh, thank you so much, John. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody told me I sounded like NPR, but I have to do that. Yes, because, exactly. Yeah. Well, I talk, uh, they were saying, you're so soft. And I have to do that because if I talk loud, then they come and shut the study door. And in the afternoon in Houston, the study gets hot. So I have to talk really soft unless they want to sweat me out. So yeah, good job. Um, I agree with Sheba's comment. Great presentation, lots of dashboards and uh, um, Given, uh, given me some ideas of where to start, but to take it slow because you can't, you can't, uh, you can't boil the ocean right away. So, good job. <laughs> Behavior is an action. All right, guys. Well, as someone once said, I don't know who it was. Um, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here because uh, eventually we will uh, sign this session off. So, uh, and the Zoom room will go bye-bye. So uh, it's great. I hope you guys have an awesome day. Make it a great week and go out there and do some awesome things with dashboards and visualizations and uh, keep connecting with each other, even outside of the community group. So y'all be good now. Thanks all. Thank you. Is the recording off? Let's no. turn it off. Still going. And I can't stop it.